Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Remote Real Estate Investor. I'm Michael Albom, and today I'm joined by my co-host, Tom Schneider and Mark Woodling. And we have a very special guest with us today. Matt Crawford is an agent out of Columbia, South Carolina. And today, Matt's going to be giving us a market overview and talk about some of the things that he and his team are able to assist buyers and sellers in doing in that market. So let's get into it. Awesome. So Matt Crawford, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Really appreciate you being on the show. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Glad to be here. And so you're out in Columbia, South Carolina. Is that right? Yeah. Sunny Columbia, man. It's about 85 degrees, you know, beautiful state, born and raised about an hour north of here. So uh, fantastic market, man. It's a good place to be. Awesome. And I'm curious, Matt, who are you an agent with? So right now, my agency is hung under the Montgomery Company, which is a pretty interesting story. And just to quickly unpack that, uh, Matt Montgomery, he's a great friend of mine. Uh, he runs a massive construction business here in the Southeast. Um, and just for the conveniency of our partnership, I ended up creating a brokerage with him. And I'm really sort of the head of the firm, sole proprietor of that brokerage, um, which I moved my company under, which is technically... Yeah, uh, Nautic Capital and Southern Capital Brothers, which is our investment brokerage underneath his umbrella. It's a perfect uh, segue, Matt. And, uh, you know, before jumping into Columbia, South Carolina, I'd love to learn a little bit more about yourself and your background and, and how you got to where you're at today. Yeah, 100 percent, Tom. You know, it's uh, it's been a journey, you know, as, as we all are inclined to take. And so, you know, I'm going to probably take this back five years. You know, I'm in Denver, Colorado, man, just loving life, sort of sowing the proverbial oats of a new broker. And I started really getting into cahoots with a lot of the investors out in Colorado. Uh, a lot of these guys were doing huge land acquisitions, building massive multifamily complexes, as well as doing something that I never heard of, which was institutional capital investing. So they were piecing together these massive SFR, BTR portfolios renting them out, stabilizing them, and then doing the disposition strategy. And I was like, what a awesome niche within the real estate arena to start cutting my teeth on. And so got licensed in Colorado, started working with these guys. The barrier to entry there for a new young agent in his 20s was so massive. I'm like, man, it'd be great if I had $600,000 for my first rental. Not the case. So I look back at my roots um, back here in Columbia, South Carolina, where I could get the first rental for about 50,000. And so jumped over here about four years ago um, and started building some institutional funds with a previous venture. Uh, we built that one to about 2,200 homes, deployed around 220 million over 24 months. Uh, I don't think I slept much. Um, I probably lost a little bit of weight, but I learned a lot, you know? <laughs> and and from there, you know, there was a, uh, you know, talk, talk about destiny, talk about fate, you know, the pandemic arose, it created a little bit of space um, to sort of see where I wanted to navigate. And, you know, I decided with a few of my other founders, uh, Jordan and Alex Fisher, to start our own company. And that's sort of how we got here today. You know, I had a, a boss who had a pretty funny joke. I was like working a lot of hours and uh, he's like, hey, 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 good news, Tom, you're getting credit for two years of work with just one year by working, you know, every day, 100 hour weeks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whew. It was a journey, man. It was like, you know, you know, first in, last out. But we had the, the gusto of, you know, being passionate and and finding, you know, a purpose within the the jungle of real estate. You know, I, at one point I thought it was so binary, you know, it's just traditional transactions between buyer and sellers. And then you start unpacking it, man. I'm like, oh man, if, if you can sell one home, you could sell a portfolio of a thousand homes. And so that's what brought us here, that's man. Awesome. Let's uh, let's learn a little bit more about the the practice today, your guys' brokerage today. Yep, yep. So, you know, we really have pivoted to fly a new banner. Uh, the banner is called Southern Capital. Um, it's a company we've had for many years. Um, and what that really does is it pieces together investment clients like you guys have at Roofstock um, with really high profile properties here in the Southeast. Um, and if we can drill down even more granular, you know, Columbia has been our top market. Um, and it's just so funny how it happened. You know, when I landed here, I wasn't thinking, oh, Columbia is going to be the most fantastic rental market ever. 
but it has just really happened that way. I mean, the average property value in ratio to the average rent rate is just so incredibly strong that it's created a lot of attraction. So at Southern Capital, um, I have Jordan Schutz. He's just like our, our techno knot, man. This guy is building these fantastic databases. He's bifurcating all these beautiful codes on the back end that parallels the software that you guys have. You know, shout out to Andy and Danielle from Roofstock. And it's just played so well in, in our court. And then Alex Fisher, the guy's basically like a pseudo general of the military. And he's just running fantastic operations um, and allowing me to sort of be on the forefront, um, gaining knowledge, making really strategic connections and providing the utmost service uh, to the clientele. And so Southern Capital sort of walks that fine line of, of servicing large institutional clients. Um, but I really, really enjoyed the opportunity that Mark and Matt and you all at Roofstock have provided us, which is working really intimately with people from all around the world. I mean, we've had, we've closed deals in India now, like doing five day mellowways. And I'm like, this is awesome, man. Cause with the, uh, with the large institutional space, you know, with any kind of maybe corporate structure, you almost become a data point. Um, you know, they're, they're really looking hard at pro formas, underwriting sheets, um, which I'm, I'm fine with. And I love the scalability of numbers, but there's something beautiful about that connection of getting on the phone with someone who's buying their first rental or their 10th rental, um, looking at, looking at their projected rent rates. Um, and that's sort of what we're doing in a nutshell on the day to day here. Let me kind of un unpack it, as Matt Crawford would say, uh, in a sense of connecting why Matt's here with us today, because, you know, Matt's one of our prized certified agents that Roofstock has partnered with. He's the one that's actually handpicking properties to bring over to Roofstock Select. So we don't just treat Matt like he's a partner, but he is sitting in the same arena with us. He is there rolling up his sleeves every single day and really bringing properties to roof stock. So <laughs> we want to give Matt a shout out and bring him on the podcast because A, he's an expert in Columbia, South Carolina. We want people to understand it, but he's the guy that's handpicking the properties for the select program. So if anybody likes what you're doing, they're going to see your work. It's almost like artwork that's going up on roof stock. So great job. Thanks for all your participation. And yes. again, I would love to love to get into the market when when we do uh, really unpack it for for the crowd, because there's a lot of things happening in South Carolina, but specifically your market. I love it. I love it. Mark, well, then let's uh, let me let me switch some gears real quick. You know, you guys have started getting the creative juices flowing. Um, so let's talk about the masterpiece, the artwork. And that breaks down to the underwriting that goes into these properties. So all that history that we just covered taught us one thing, and that's how to underwrite really well, uh, to be the best underwriters, right? Um, in South Carolina, you know, I'm putting that out there into the universe. And so it, it is an art form. You know, we're looking at a ton of different data points. We're looking at so many different comps, whether it's purchase comps, rent comps. We're looking at outlier data that we're pulling off Airbnb, uh, AirDNA. Like we're trying to figure out how many data points can I put on this one property to make it a sure bet for an investor. And that really is what's given us the success with the Roofstock program. You know, as Mark mentioned, you know, we're, we're looking at these properties every single day, manually underwriting them, you know, which is a huge, huge help from Jordan, my partner, you know, really appreciate you, Jordan, when you see this. But we're getting on there and everything is converting because we've already done that heavy lifting up front. You know, and I think that's sort of the secret sauce here, as well as being so intimate with the market here. And that's just the beauty of painting this piece for you guys. Matt, so if we can peel back another layer of this proverbial onion here, what are you seeing? Are you able to get a finger on what makes great investment properties in Colombia? A hundred percent, Mike. You know, it's... It's going to come down like the easiest way is my hot zones. You know, there's a, uh, there's zip codes, you know, 29209, 29206, you know, 29203. I want to stay away from, except if I'm on this one side of the street. And so just being able to speak on the micro locality, I think that's such an important word here, uh, is a huge service to these investors. And then, you know, like any, you know, skilled tradesman of his craft, you get to a point where you can almost look at a property as long as it sort of meets the actual locale checkbox in my mind, I can tell you if this is going to be a great rental or not. And I can also tell you 
if the area is going to have a specific tenant demographic that's going to play in to the longevity of your asset. Um, and that simply just comes from experience, from data, you know, those probably now 25 different homes that we've managed to underwrite, put in the pipeline, put a tenant in there and have it stabilized. And so that really has allowed us to speak really clearly to the Roofstock clientele. That's such a good point. Cause like we've said in other episodes, you know, the, the, what, the one thing you can never change about a property is the location. So getting that right off the bat is, is so critical. Oh man. And, and, it, it, you know, I'm not going to lie. It's sort of fun because you go across the bridge here in Columbia, you have, you have greater Columbia, then you have West Columbia, which is a whole different municipality. And it's split by a huge river called the Congaree. Five years ago, there was no one saying, Hey, let's head across the river. It was almost like that was uh, a less developed obtuse area. Well, now these veterans just came in, they put $4 million into a brand new brewery right on the river. And so I'm doing reconnaissance, hitting up the brewery, checking out all the properties around there and then actually sourcing <laughs> data, you know? And so it's, it's a lot of give and take, but you know, it's how creative can you get with your market? You know, your market in my eyes is a product, you know, how can you literally turn these widgets, polish this product to make it presentable and digestible from somebody who's investing all the way from California. And that's what we're doing. I'd love to hear about some of the broader kind of like macro tailwind. So Columbia is the capital of the state. Um, what other, you know, how else would you describe the sort of, you know, general kind of tailwinds beyond, uh, behind the Columbia, South Carolina market? Like what are the major employers, all that good stuff? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome question, Tom. And it's, it's so just... To me, it's a beautiful thing what's happening here. So an hour north of here, you have Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, 2018 ranked the number one city for millennial retention in the U.S. Um, you know, two and, a half, two and a half hours east of here, you have Charleston, South Carolina, ranked the number one uh, best small town in the U.S. to live several years in a row. If you go an hour and a half northwest, you're in Greenville, South Carolina, which has also have gone through this huge development curve. And then you have little Columbia right in the smack middle of the state that has been like overseen for the last seven years as each one of these towns develops. And we're now starting to see this huge shift of people being priced out of assets in Charlotte, Greenville, and Charleston. And so all that wealth is coming right to the center of the state now. And this is super evident in probably the last three to four years, like, you know, call it serendipity or what may have you, but right when I moved here, it was the first time institutional capital really got into this market. And now it is just turning. And to parallel that, the big players are now coming to town. These huge multinational conglomerates, um, just to rattle a few off, we have Prisma Health. Uh, Prisma Health basically aggregates massive hospital systems, puts them under the Prisma banner, sort of puts a new culture and spin on the healthcare that has exploded here. They bought up everything in Columbia and Lexington and Irmo with that medical lens now on Columbia, Nephron Pharmaceuticals, one of the largest pharmaceutical manufacturers in the country actually opened up their HQ here in Lexington. I think it brought around like 12,000 jobs to town. I mean, you cannot go out and meet somebody now that doesn't have a gig at Nephron. Uh, so those two players really showed that Columbia can get out of sort of the capital education scene. And now we're having huge entities pick up. Uh, so outside of the medical field, of course, you're going to have education. You have the University of South Carolina. Um, for all you awesome investors out there, this is a cash grab of amazing students. It has fantastic business program and a law program that sort of, as you can sort of insinuate, is going to feed into the rentals, especially if we're going to be plotting these five to 10 miles outside of downtown Columbia. Um, and I would say probably the third is going to be your, your political and your military industry. Uh, we have Fort Jackson right here. It's the largest trainee base in all of the U.S., I believe, for new recruits. Um, so what we've done as well is we pivoted to the industry. So on my personal portfolios, we're actually doing a majority of short-term rentals, Airbnb models, uh, which is something that, you know, if you guys are ever interested in, I'd love to also unpack that to sort of look at the underwriting scales between 
a 12 month long term lease versus if we put this into another tier of short term leases. Um, but all those things just play perfectly together with the assets that are available in Colombia. So Matt, I always like to play around with the Economic Development Council websites and like really dig into what's happening. Like, how are these, how is the local uh, city trying to draw in outside business, right? And so they're always putting a ton of numbers up there. So I see that there's a ton of renters, there's a young population, but tell me uh, one thing I didn't see on there is tech. What's happening on the tech scene out there? What kind of jobs do you think are being developed? And maybe are there a ton of startups moving in or yeah, go into a little detail about that. A hundred percent. And I think that's also the beauty of a lot of people, especially in the startup world, you know, being a, a entrepreneur myself, you know, might not have that $50,000 liquid to plop down on a $220,000 starter home. Or in fact, they might have used that liquid to actually inject into their business or building. And we're seeing an explosion of that community here. Um, maybe it's because SCRA is a huge um, grantee here in Columbia, South Carolina. They're giving everything from 20,000 up to $200,000 startup grants. So people are just flooding this town, seeking those grants. You know, there's low, low barrier to entry. This is not Charlotte, this is not Atlanta. Um, so you really can get great visibility into the market without having all the noise of similar competitors. Um, everything from Fiveable. Fiveable is a fantastic tech startup here. Um, shout out to those guys. You know, we meet with them all the time. And then even more so, Mark, to your point, because of that community, because of that influx that's now happening and, and putting this polish on this town, there's a massive tech, uh, what would you call this? Like a... Uh, like a, a tech village, man. It's probably like, I don't know, a million square feet total, but it's going to be housing uh, tons and tons of startups to come in and basically have office space for rent. Basically like an incubator where everybody can come together, exchange ideas and magic happens in those kinds of environments. It's massive. And I think I can add one more layer to that as well is that at the key here, you know, Tom and Mike to fill you guys in, this is a true tertiary market, right? You know, this is tertiary being that we have moderately low purchase prices and comparative to the historical rent rates. And so in any kind of investor's mind, you really want to be searching for that true tertiary market, but not only at a tertiary market, but a evolving tertiary market that's about to flip over into the secondary category. Secondary, secondary meaning you have a little bit more modernized uh, commercial entities. You have a lot more retention of your population that has grown there. Uh, and then you have just an a average household income starting to rise on a gradual slope. That literally is happening right now. And that's what's helping retain the startups, retain the young millennials that are getting out of their MBAs or college. And we're about to flip into a true secondary market, whereas Charlotte, Charleston, Atlanta, I would say are primary. You know, they have massive, massive inventory, but also high purchase prices. We are about to evolve into that secondary market, which I think is the perfect time to start planting some seeds, some dollars here, because in three to five years, this, this city is going to have a total different culture, a different feel. And as you guys would you know, understand, a totally different marketplace. And that's what makes it so healthy right now to invest in. So Matt, let's let's unpack that a little bit further and talk about some specifics. So if somebody is just a first time investor looking at different markets, which is a question we get all the time in the Roofstock Academy is, hey, what market should I be looking at? Can you give us an idea of what that entry purchase price looks like and what someone could expect uh, for rent? And maybe give us an idea of some different neighborhoods to look at at some different price point and rental amounts. Boom. Let's rock and roll, Michael. You know, for everyone out there watching, you know, my two cents is let's get started, right? Come on, like we will literally show you the ins and outs of this marketplace, but it's easy to have analysis paralysis, you know, especially when we're building a portfolio when we're investing, you know, hard earned capital or anything. I understand that there's this level of nervousness. How do I choose between San Antonio or do I look in California? I've never even heard of Columbia, South Carolina. But I can tell you, if you guys just give us the opportunity to show you the ins and outs, you'll see exactly why this is the number one market on the Roofstock Buyer Program right now. 
And that's because you can come in, you can buy a house for eighty thousand um, dollars for for eighty k. If we have it in the bank account collectively, I'm going to put us over in West Columbia. I'm going to literally draw you a circle that is probably around five minutes from the actual riverfront. And so the fact that we can get that close to a beautiful amenity, you're about to be 10 minutes from downtown for $80,000. It's going to rent out conservatively, probably 1200 to 1250. Now, if we come in there, we slap granite, stainless steel appliances, maybe put some LVT on the flooring, that $80,000 property literally now could probably fetch $1,500 for a, a modest three bed, two bath. And I am hard pressed to find another market that can support such high rent rates with such low barrier to entry on the purchase price without maybe going to specific places in Birmingham, Alabama, or what may have you. But that's the beauty of Columbia right now. As we're talking, I'm like looking over Zillow in the area. And uh, man, I love how that's amazing. I love how self-serving this podcast is. <laughs> we'll definitely be talking after Matt. Like, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I kind of love the thesis on like, <laughs> it's a beautiful yeah. thing. Well, what I love about it, it's a state yep. capital, yep. right? And you have a major college there. I live in Dallas near Austin, Texas. And it's like the two things I see with Austin are the same exact thing that you would see in Columbia. It's just, it may be years behind. So people move to affordable areas and where they can stay young, right? You get out of college, you find a good job, you can stay hanging around your friends if you really wanted to. So there could be some really cool things I see in Columbia happening. Massive. And Mark, I can even add some two cents there and I can parallel it too with your point, Mike, about, you know, what are some micro neighborhoods to start really searching in? And so if anybody's taking notes, Rosewood, you know, Rosewood is where you want to be. It's literally maybe what happened to Austin five years ago before Austin became keep Austin weird. Like that's what's happening in Rosewood right now. We have world renowned graffiti artists, you know, tagging massive walls like the coolest stuff that, you know, really did not reflect in Colombia even two years ago, even like pre pandemic, like there was no, no justified culture. There certainly wasn't a art area. You know, I think back to, to Denver, Colorado and the river North district, which is now this huge art conglomerate that literally is happening here. So if you're ever searching for properties, massive, massive student population, uh, it's going to be in the Rosewood neighborhood area. And it really is following that path like Austin is of creating its own personality, its own culture and its own distinctive voice. Where is Rosewood? I'm l looking at my map right now, and this is probably for helpful people pulling up their map. Where is Rosewood relative to the center of uh, Columbia? Maybe like near a freeway or where? where, where is? Yeah. If I'm looking at the center of Columbia, like yep. you can literally pinpoint the very center actually is the state capital. It is three miles to the right. So literally, if you just look to the right, I'm pretty sure the zip code is 29204. No, it'd be 29206. Um, but there, there is a main vein. Oh, there it is. That, Found uh, it. It's literally called Rosewood yep, yep. Tom. So inside awesome of 77, area. just south of 378. Is that right? Cool. Yep, that is 100% right. And it's just like, it's the coolest spot, man. There's like a 1900s airstrip that's been this like massive hangout spot. Um, they actually converted the hangar into a state of the art brewery. And so, you know, using those like outlier data points, like especially with something as commod commoditized as a brewery, I've been seeing values on these properties jump up 10 to 13% year after year, just because we're starting to retain more and more populations and it's becoming hip, you know, for whatever arbitrary term and that you're is. Looking at the great school ratings, I'm seeing an elementary school at an eight which is incredibly high yep. hand middle school at a five and Dreher high school at a seven. Those are, those are fantastic mm -hmm. school scores. And that's like, one of my big criteria that I look at. So, uh, we, we might need to, you know, hide this Spoken part of the podcast. Time. Cause I, or, 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 <laughs> or let's do the opposite. So Matt Crawford, <laughs> after this, you have full, you have full control. Go ahead and post some properties on the roof stock in the Rosewood neighborhood, <laughs> and let's let's see it through the roof stock lens. So I, I think we're on to something here. Absolutely. And then you know, Tom, now that you're sort of looking into the map, you know, I'm going to sort of drive us down I-26. Let's head west, probably about 13 minutes. I'm getting off at exit 103B, and I'm in Lexington, South Carolina yeah. now. 
you know, so a lot of people, a lot of people will come in and say, you know, Matt, tell me about Columbia. So the big four that you want to really start investing in is going to be Columbia proper, West Columbia, Casey, which is right parallel to West Columbia and Lexington, man. Lexington is like hot Atlanta, baby, but a lot smaller. And it's just fantastic. It's created its own culture. It's right beside uh, Lake Murray, which for this area, you know, it literally is, I'm sweating in my back. I'm glad you can only see my front right now, is a beautiful <laughs> thing to have. And these, you know, you're going to have a little bit more competition, but anywhere in Lexington, especially centralized and looking east, fantastic inventory. So Matt, this is this is really great. And I love that delta between the purchase price and the rental amount. I mean, that sounds like it's really, really strong. Something that yes, our investors see is either able to make or break these deals as an investment is often hinging on property taxes. Can you talk to us a little bit about how property taxes work in the Columbia market? Yes, 100%. And if Mayor Benjamin, you're watching this, please answer my emails <laughs> because the taxes are <laughs> tough, man. You know, it really is. It's, it's the double edged sword here. You know, with such a fantastic market, with such beautiful rent rates and purchase prices, of course, there has to be some catch. And that is going to be the non owner occupied property taxes. You know, and these are going to really come in roughly around 3% of your gross purchase price. So, you know, on a four bed, two and a half bath, beautiful new build that's, you know, 210000 man, you're going to get slapped with like a $5,700 tax bill. So, I mean, if you're in cash flowing, you know, a couple hundred bucks a month, that means you're probably only going to net maybe four to five to six K annually. It eats up a lot of the margin. So, Mayor Benjamin, yeah. please, can we change that law and attract more beautiful investors in the state? But what we're doing to offset that is looking for those lower purchase price assets, right? So, a lot of people, they, they want the new builds. You know, they, they sound sexy on paper. But, you know, to win, to win in this market and to combat that 3% non-owner occupied property tax, you know, let's play in the 120 to $150,000 range. So now your taxes are three grand and we're going to get that thing rented at 1500 to 1800. You know, that's how we can combat such a tax problem. And just as a kind of a point of reference, so folks understand why people might be continuing to move to Columbia, what is the tax rate for an owner occupant? Oh man, it's less than half, man. It's like, you're not really paying much, you know, and there's a, a ton of grants out here as well to incentivize people to move to Columbia. Um, you know, and I can even go into a little bit of deeper history of why that is so, you know, the 1980s, the sort of the war on drugs really hit Columbia hard because this is historically a mill labor force town. You know, we have a massive flour mill in the heart of downtown that now has become sort of a legacy item. You know, people have weddings on top of it now. Um, and so that demographic really was affected mm -hmm. by the 1980s pandemic itself. And a lot of the assets and the single family units sort of were deteriorated, especially in some zip codes. Nobody would move there and develop them. And so now the state is giving these tons of grants for people to come in and give more life to this city as we're sort of pulling out of that prior, that prior culture that really stuck around really until today. There's still pockets in 29203 that are you know less than desirable because the demographic there has sort of been inundated with the ancestral baggage that came from a few years ago this is awesome michael do you have any more questions or mark anything else you want to touch on i'm um this has been yeah i'm i'm i'm, I'm a fan i don't know i've been looking at this market for a while and this kind of conversation really is uh drawing me in a little bit a little bit closer for sure yeah i guess my, my only other question matt would be kind of on that on the example you gave previously where you're getting in for 80k putting in the granite countertops and stainless steel and now the thing could rent is renting at 1500 uh is there any type of reassessment that the county is going to do on any kind of regular frequency or is your property tax truly tied to the purchase price at acquisition boom so so everybody let's get some house hacking skills ready because it's tied to that that gross acquisition price and so that's how you get to beat the market here is you can get buy a, a distressed property for 60k. You know, let's throw 20, let's put $25,000 into it. You know, let's do 
paint, windows, flooring, kitchen. And that thing's now going to appreciate at a praise, probably at 120, 125 K rent out for 1500. But now we're only tied to that $60,000 original purchase price. We're going to let it season. We're going to refire our money and we're going to keep it rolling. And that's exactly what we did in tranches of a hundred properties. Every hundred, we do that exact strategy, pull that cash out, recycle it. It's your, your, your gilded BRR burr strategy and it works perfectly for this market. And so actually Mark is very well aware of this, that there are a few individuals that have come to this, this market space through you guys. And we're actually doing that right now. So, you know, Southern Capital, we are a acquisition renovation management company. And so we have what I literally would crown the best crew because we have cycled through the last years of who guys can keep up with the scalability, the consistency, and the sourcing of these renovations. And that's where Matt Montgomery, who we mentioned at the very start of this cast, uh, that company now supports all of our renovations. And so guys, if you're interested in the Columbia market, you want to find a way to get around the property taxes. You know, my resources are your resources. I'm more than happy to have a scope built for you, completely itemized with timelines. Uh, general rule of thumb is for every $1,000 renovation, it's about one day. So a, a $30,000 job should take us about a solid month to do. But that is one really great way to start cash flowing quickly here in Columbia. That's great. And let's just kind of highlight that again, Matt. So if I'm an investor, I'm interested in doing some kind of value add renovation and then putting a long term tenant in place. I can do that all with you and Southern Capital. You'll take care of the acquisitions, you'll assist in the renovations, and then you'll manage the property once I've got it completed. A hundred percent. So that was the whole idea of creating a holistic turnkey investment centric brokerage. That is a mouthful, but basically we're here to be your best friend. And not only that, but we have the opportunity and the blessings of working with people like Mark yourself, Michael, yourself, Tom, the whole team at Roofstock. So their back office, our front office and operations literally have made such matrimony moving forward that we're here to help. Oh, I love it. Tom, like you said, <laughs> I got to make a couple of phone calls over, the, over to Matt's office here after we hop off. Yeah. Come and, on, the ship's sailing, yeah. baby. <laughs> right. Hey, on. I got one last question. Now that I think about it, one last question for you, Matt. So buyers can really understand you know, what the competition level is there. Are you seeing multiple offer situations on every property or is it less frequent like we see in like Birmingham right now where almost every property has multiple offers? Awesome, awesome question, Mark. And so for, you know, everybody tuning in, you know, it's, you know, we're almost 50%, maybe the last data I checked, 48% less inventory than last April of 2020. So every offer is almost, I would say 95% a multiple offer situation, but this is what we're going to do. You know, we're going to get your offer. We're going to expedite it being built out, signed by you. I literally pick up my call and just being a player here in Columbia, I know a lot of the brokers say, Hey man, this is one of my investment clients. You know, you know, I know you love your, your buyers and sellers, but I really value these people and their trust. Can you please put me at the top of the pile? And so that's, that's me. I'm, I'm kissing babies and shaking hands. And so I really push that as far <laughs> as I can. But if, if you guys are coming in, we really have, I would say one shot to get it right, but that's not the case because if I know that we're not the highest and best, I'm going to allow us that window, you know? And a lot of times they say, Hey Matt, we're sorry. The sellers didn't even, you know, want a call for highest and best, but I'm pressing these people. I'm following up. I'm texting them. Say, Hey man, before you accept, you got to give me some feedback. So that's number one. So guys, if you come in, Know that we're going to be right at ask, you know, if not five to seven percent over ask, but that's not the end of the story. There's a beautiful part. And this is really what I think makes us dangerous is our off market channel. So for the last several years, I've amassed this massive contacts through asset managers, through different real estate lawyers from local investors, portfolios, trust funds and say, hey, guys, like funnel your, your inventory through me. And I can bring a really, really healthy, productive investment base to buy these acquisitions. And so I think that's what makes Columbia stand out from the rest is that we're uploading exclusive off-market properties every single day that are not publicly facing. They're not on Zillow. They're not on the MLS. So they get to sort of for, foresee that wave of multiple offer situations and avoid it completely. And that's something that we've done 
tons of transactions with the Roofstock clientele as well. And just to fill in on that, so you're doing that through our BYOP program, right? The bring your own property. So you can send yes, a private link because otherwise we can't post those because they're not on the MLS and we don't have the listing, which would be the ones that go on our exclusive marketplace. But there's still a way for buyers to get access to that inventory through you. So if they want to reach out, you can show them some of those properties, but still use the roof stock lens so they can get the roof stock guarantees if, if the properties are in the right condition. A hundred percent mark in, you know, you know, Fred Haynes, I hope you're watching this podcast. He just picked up four off markets from us here in Columbia. The guy is a champion. Fred, thank you so much. Pleasure to work with you. And we're going to get those things closed here in the month of May. Oh, that's so exciting. So Matt, if folks do want to reach out to you or Southern Capital or have questions about, you know, reaching out, uh, purchasing properties, getting rehab or management services, what's the best way for folks to get in touch with you? Man, I, I love the email. So M Crawford at roofstock.com. Shoot me an email. I'll shoot you a Calendly link. We'll get a phone call. I absolutely love that discovery phase to sort of hear what your investment footprint is, um, what you are looking from this market, and that's going to help me perform for you guys. All righty, everybody. That was our episode. A big, big, big thank you to Matt for coming on the show. A lot of fun. Kudos to you for crushing it out there with the Roofstock Select program as a certified agent. Uh, we definitely look forward to having you on again. If you like the episode, feel free to leave us a rating or review wherever it is in your podcast. And as always, we love to hear new episode ideas, topics, feedback in the comments section if you want to hear about a particular episode. Again, thank you all for watching. We look forward to seeing you on the next one. Happy investing. Bye.